a couple beekeepers in here. How many beekeepers do we have in here that are currently keeping bees? We'll see in the spring. We'll see, we'll see in the spring. You had bees this last year? Don't know if they're alive yet. That's why you're saying that? Never know. <laughs> yeah. So this, we're just going to kind of do a, just a quick overview of uh, how to get bees, what to expect. That's kind of this course. That's what we're, a quick overview. Um, go ahead and click it, Lars. There's one rule to beekeeping. Does anybody here know what that one rule is? Click it again, Lars. There isn't any rules. Bees, when you think you know what 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 needs to happen, the bees they change their mind on what you have to happen. Go ahead. Why start beekeeping? These are the reasons that we we get. I'm keeping bees for honey, pollination to help the bees, and bees are just cool. They're all good reasons to keep bees, except for the first one. If that's the only reason why you're going to keep bees, go find a beekeeper to buy your honey from. Because it's an expensive amount of honey to keep bees, and it's just going to be more frustration than it is. You're going to spend a lot of money on equipment, and bees are going to die. Um, it, it takes a little bit to, I shouldn't say a little bit, it takes a lot to get your bees to get through the winter. Um, if you're just going to take your bees and plunk them over there and bees have been doing their thing for a million years, they can do their thing. Um, it's, we, call, we, we call that bee having or bee havers, them are not beekeepers. Um, if that's how you're going to keep bees, you're going to lose them every year. They're not going to make it through the winter. Bees need help getting through the winter here. This, our climate isn't, with the genetics that we have in bees now, our climate, they just don't just survive just because they know how. Um, pollination. Bees, they pollinate, that's what they do. They make honey. Um, if you're getting bees, to just pollinate, I, it kind of a little bit goes in with the honey, um, but most people who are doing it with poll just pollinate, they're going to work with the bees a little bit. Um, bees need need to be worked. I mean, you need to go in there. Honey bees need help. That's to help the bees. We have a lot of people that come in. They just want to help the bees because they know that they're important. And bees are cool. Most people who think that bees are cool, they can't stay out of the hive. Um, that's that's just part of thinking they're cool. You got to get in there and see what's going on. Go ahead and click it, Lars. Ninety percent of the bees are owned by one percent of the beekeepers. That is part of the reason why we have some of the problems that we have. That one percent of beekeepers, they're commercial beekeepers. Um, there's 20,000 roughly commercial beekeepers in the U.S. That's the extent of, and only a small portion of those raise bees. Our bees are getting inbred because of that reason. That is one of the reasons why a person should get into bees. The more bee hives that are around and about, the less we're going to have inbred bees. When a new queen is a virgin queen goes on her mating flight, she flies off and she breeds with drone bees. She can fly up to 10 miles on her mating flight. So she goes, she flies off and looks for bees that she's not related to. She'll generally fly three miles at least to find that drone cloud of bees. Um, so to get that 1%, if we can everybody can help the bees that way. In the early late 1800s, early 1900s, 4% of the population in the U.S. didn't have bees. Today, less than 4% of the Americans have bees. So it's, it's kind of a quite a, of course we're more populated today, but not that much. 
Go ahead. Anybody has questions, feel free and fire away the questions. I do a little bit better once you guys start asking your questions. Mm -hmm. How often um, do you collect honey from the I do once a year. Once a year? Once a year. Well, I shouldn't. If my equipment starts getting filled up, sometimes I'm forced to collect honey before the end of the season. But I, I pull my honey at the end of the season. And that's typically, unless you're a commercial beekeeper, them commercial beekeepers, they pull honey regular. And especially when they're moving from one place to the other, they pull all the honey if off. If you collect at the end of the season, do they have enough time to store for winter? I make sure I leave them enough, enough honey. That's why I collect at the end of the at the end of the season, so that I can make sure that them bees have. Here in the valley, we need to have 100 pounds of honey. That's what we need. To yep, to, for them to make it through the winter. Go to the next one. Keeping bees is a local thing. It's we can learn a lot on the internet. But there's a lot of parts to a beekeeping that we want to learn from local beekeepers. Um, there's a lot of different things that you do that you do based on where you're at. Even here in the valley, we got those that live right here in the valley that keep bees. Then we got those that live in the hills, different directions around. They've got to do things a little bit different than somebody who lives in, you know, lower valley or there's in lower valley they have a whole set of rules that don't apply to everybody else because of canola. So there's um, your local, where you're at, you want to find somebody who's keeping bees that can kind of help you get through the problems in your area. Go ahead. This is, just shows the three kinds of bees that are in the hive. Most people when they come into the store, or a lot of people when they come in the store we talk to, they think the male bee is the worker bee, that, that's the one that does all the hot work in the hive. That is completely the opposite. The males, the drone bee, which is on the bottom, he does absolutely nothing in the hive. His sole purpose in life is to mate with a virgin queen. Once he mates with the virgin queen, his life is over. So that's, there's probably, in the middle of the summer, 10% of the bees in the hive are drone bees. And they, they don't collect honey, they don't do, they do nothing productive for the hive. They eat honey and wait around for a virgin queen. The middle one, that's the queen bee. Um, her sole purpose in life is to lay eggs. She can't even feed herself. She can't take care of herself in any form or manner. She has to have tenants take care of her. That is why she's called the queen. Um, she can lay up to 3,000 eggs a day depending on the season, what, how many bees that are there to cover. And then the top one, that's the worker bee. Um, you can have 120, 140,000 of those in your beehive. Um, most packages that you buy are three pound packages. There's roughly, roughly 15,000 bees in a three pound package. And a, th and a package of bees, this would here is what a package of bees looks like. That's what it comes in. Um, and that's the most common way to purchase bees. You can purchase them from Murdoch's Western Bee. Most years we sell the packages. This year we did not. Um, package bees, they are a little bit harder to get. That's not their queen that's in the queen cage in there. They've got to um, accept her. It takes time to accept her. There's a candy plug that's in there. The box that's underneath is called a nuke box. This is um, just kind of how a bee's life starts. Starts as the queen lays an egg. Um, it takes 21 days for that egg to hatch. 20, 21 days for it to become an adult. It takes three days to hatch. That's an egg to a larva. Um, the larva, they feed the larva fermented pollen. Um, it's a mixture of pollen and saliva um, from their guts kind of makes what they call bee bread. It ferments. That's what they feed to the larva. 
they also eat some of that themselves. We can move on to the next one. This here, the queen, this one says the queen can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day, 15 to 2,000 eggs a day, but that's, she can lay up to 3,000 eggs a day um, if the conditions are right. Go again, Mars. You know, it went the wrong direction. Oh no, I just repeated some information on there. This is a, um, kind of what the different jobs of a worker be. They start out as a, a cleaner, um, cleaning, they, they start out cleaning their own, their own cell. Um, that's the first job. I have a different um, class that we actually teach and we have a slide in there that says they're, they're one minute old and they're forced to clean their room already. Um, so that's the, the bees they're born, they're cleaning. From there, they move to being the nurse bees. They're the ones who take care of the larva. They remove any sick. Um, they feed. They just, they're, they're the main caretakers of the larva that, as, that hasn't hatched yet. Um, they go into, I don't know, they're fanning bees, honey transfer, wax building, guarding bees. They go through all those steps. The last step of a bee's life is the forager. They're the ones that you see. They're on the last stage of their life. They fly until they die. Their wings wear out. That's what kills a honeybee. They can't make it to the hive and then either something gets them or the temperature kills them, rain kills them. Um, so their wings wear out. That's what kills a honeybee. Go ahead. This frame just shows queen cells. Um, it looks kind of like a peanut. If you're in your hive and you see that, that's a sure sign that you have something wrong. You do not want to see that unless you are intentionally making a split. Um, either something happened to your queen or you were not taking care of your hive and it's way too full of bees and they're getting ready to swarm. Um, if they're getting ready to swarm, at this point, there's really nothing you can do to stop them. You can try to cut out the queen cells, but eventually they're going to swarm anyways. You're going to want to take those cells with those swarms on it, or those queen cells, and put it in a different box and let them make an artificial swarm where you'll lose the bees that you do have. And probably, if I, if I lose you, go ahead and tell me to slow down and ask a question. You just said an artificial swarm. Do you mean that? They're going, but they don't have any place to go. No, what I mean by artificial swarm, so if you have a hive and it's doing this, you're going to take those frames and put them in something like this. You're moving them out of there, and that's creating artificial swarm. You've, you've removed them from the queen. You've given them space. Actually, most of the time, you would leave those in the existing hive, and you'd move the queen out with bees and and no larva and that's how you produce the queen disappears she's in her hive you don't lose her you don't lose the bees they one of these things hatches a new a new virgin queen is out she goes on her mating flight if she is successful to make it back you have now you have two hives and all you've done is made you know just split them apart if you don't do anything if you just leave this bee them bees they're gonna they're gonna swarm they're gonna take off and everything that can fly in that hive goes with the queen to a new home. So the first half of their life, honeybees can't fly. They're, they're, they're stuck in that box. And uh, when they become guard bees, fan, fan bees, they become fan bees. That kind of works their wings, gets them, them muscles going, gets them, you know, and, and they gradually go into that. Um, so when, she's, when they swarm, they, they actually take her with. She don't, she don't go off. They, they go out and find a home, come back. They actually vote on it. They, you'll see, you'll see it. the scout bees go out, find a home, and you'll see the bees. They come in, and they, they check the whole thing out, and they actually bring all that information back to the hive, and they'll bring it back several different places, and they decide, okay, we're going to this one. 
once they decide where they're going, they just take the queen and they go. Um, a lot of times they'll come out and they'll land on something and it's, you know, it's not a single shot. Go ahead. Male. Female. The, the, the males are the drones that I talked about before. They, their sole purpose in life is strictly to mate. So when you take that part of the hive out and put it in a box like that, they just automatically go to that box? Like if they were swarming with the queen and then build a new hive? No, you have to move them in there. Yeah, move that in there, right? Yep. And they just follow? No, I mean, the bees that are on the frame, um, full of bees. So when you pull, when you pull a frame out, this is covered with bees. So it's not, you know, so you just take that frame out, put it in the other hive, and the bees are there. If you have a lot of bees in that hive, you know, you can shake some, take a frame that you're leaving behind and shake some bees in there. You just want to make sure the queen isn't on that frame that you're shaking. You know, so they won't, right, and you want to, uh, the frame that you move, the reason that the, you would move the queen instead of these queen cells, is the bees that can fly, they're gonna go back to home. But if, if the queen is in that hive, when, they've moved, when you move it over there, her, her pheromones are there, that's what's attracting keeping them bees of that box. They're going to come back to her rather than go back to the old home. So you, mo you moved them, you stirred them up, you closed them up. When they come out, they're going to reorient themselves. This is home. Any other questions on that? As soon as you see the queen cell starting, does that mean your queen is done? The existing queen? That means they're going to swarm. They're going to swarm. They're going to swarm. You still have an existing queen in there, correct? Right. And they're going to take the new hatched queen and swarm? No, they, the old queen is who swarms. The old queen. The new, they'll swarm. So they're going to take the old queen and depart. Yep. And then the new cells will hatch into a, a new queen. One cell will hatch. And that one. Like that existing hive. Right. And that, that queen, when she hatches, the first thing she does is she cruises around that hive and she stings the other ones through the side. She kills them. Yep. Yeah, so the first one out, that's... I shouldn't say that because sometimes they will go around and that hive is still too full. They can't, they can't produce a... Um, they can't work there. They'll go on their mating flight and come back and, and take the bees that can fly and swarm again. A lot of times what ends up happening is a hive that swarms, that isn't taken care of, it'll swarm up to six times. You know, it, unless somebody catches it and starts taking care of it. But if it's in the wild, they'll swarm four to six times. They're, they just, they're overcrowded, and the first one takes what, what can fly and, and swarms. And these swarms at large go back, back up onto that. So you can see how there's, there's different, there's a whole bunch of queen cells on this thing. When they make queen cells, they don't make queen cells that are all the same age. They'll make two or three, maybe four that are the same age. Then they'll come over here and it'll be several days, maybe even a week apart. They'll make some more. But when that first queen cell hatches, a lot of times there's queen cells that aren't even capped yet. You know, and that's, that's because that hive is too full and that's that that's that process. That first queen that hatches, what they go f and look for is once they get to a certain age, they start putting off a pheromone. And that's, they smell that pheromone and they sting it through the side. So they might, she might hatch and she might only kill three or four of them. And she knows she has to swarm. So she goes on her mating flight, comes back. Them other ones, they're getting, you know, r close to hatching. She don't care because she's leaving. You know, she's taking what can fly. And that's, We've, we've got calls to come get swarms at somebody's house. It wasn't my hive, but it's, it's in my tree. And we'll collect the swarm and, you know, four days later, I have another swarm in this tree. I don't, I don't know what. And when you finally go through the hive, they don't have a queen. They just have a bunch of queen cells and half the bees that are in there. Did you raise your hand? One of the, one of the things that beekeepers, new beekeepers, 
they get their bees and they're afraid of going into their hive. You know, they're, they're going to hurt the queen. They're going to, so they don't go in there. They're just, it's, it's better just to leave them be. If you're going to, if you leave your bees be, you're not learning anything. And you're, I mean, you're going to have bees that swarm and you're going to lose them. Um, when I got my first bees, I was real timid about going in my hive. They say to, you know, don't keep, you know, a minute, two minutes, max, keep that out. I disagree with that. When I first went, was going in my hives, I quickly kind of look. I never, got, I never really seen, truly seen something. You know, it was just kind of all Greek. Takes a while to learn what you're looking at. Um, take them out, look at them, see what's there. You're, you're not going to learn anything if you do. My, I had bees for about a month, month and a half, and I realized these bees aren't going to make it through the winter anyways. I, I don't have enough experience to get these things through the winter. So why am I so stressed about killing my queen? You know, winter's going to take care of them. I need to learn what this queen, what this hive is doing. At that point, I relaxed. I wasn't paranoid about killing my queen. Um, I went in there. I raised 31 queens my first year. Um, 13 of them. I went through the winter with 13 hives. Six of those hives made it through the winter. I bought four. So by going through them hives, quit being afraid of killing my bees, I learned what I was looking at. I was able to experiment, do things. I wasn't nervous about killing those queens. I actually came out farther ahead than if I had kept that same paranoia going through looking at my bees. So don't, don't be afraid to, there's something, you know, there's something there that, hey, what is this? Look at it. Try to figure it out. Look, watch the bees, what they're doing. The bees on that frame, there's, you know, 500 bees on one frame. Maybe more than that. <coughs> there, on some of them frames, it's nothing but bees, but they're all doing something. You can learn by just watching, you know, what are they doing? You can watch them do circle dances, wiggle dances, you know, watch them clean each other. A lot of times when you first watch them cleaning each other, you think, what are they doing with this bee? They're killing the poor thing. You know, if, if you're just, you know, quickly glancing over the, the frame and stuffing it back in the hive, you, you missed all that. You didn't learn anything. Um, I don't know. Let's go to the next. Wait, is, is there a local swarm team? So, we, Flathead Valley Beekeeping Association yeah. has a Google group page and a Facebook page. And the swarms... The swarms, our store gets calls that there's swarms, and we post on there. Also, Pamela, um, I think her name is Anderson. She's part of this Free the Seeds event. She does all of the um, social media part of um, both the Facebook page and the um, Google Group page. What so she, she Flathead Valley Beekeeping Association, has a Google Group page and a Facebook page. They also have a web page. <laughs> so if they post on there the swarms that come in and other people that are part of the association when they see a swarm or they get notified that there's a swarm if they can't go get it they'll post on there. So if you're looking for swarms that's a good, that's a good, um, just watch those two. But if you um, just need help with your own, catching your own swarm. <laughs> there's many people who will, um, you know, if you, if you go on there and post, hey, I, I need help with the swarm, there's people who will come help you. Um, we have a maintenance service where we come out, but we charge for that. Um, so if you're just looking for some free help, I would try. I would try there. That's where I would try first. Is, you know, posting on there. Hey, I got this problem, or this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I want to do. And a lot of these retired people, some of them just go around and collect swarms and give them to people. I mean, that's their. That's. I mean, so if you're wanting, if you're wanting a swarm, you know, and that you put it on there, they'll let you know. Hey, I I do swarms. Come with me, help me, and we'll walk you through the. The process. Swarms are fun. They're a lot of fun to catch. Swarms are docile. Um, I don't have a video on here. I, I, I've collected swarms with my bare hands and just dumped them in boxes. 
Um, it, the first time was a little bit um, nerve-wracking. It feels like you're sticking your hands into Velcro. Um, it's, but yeah, it's they're they're pretty docile. You can get stung. I have been stung, but very seldom do you get stung. So this is a standard beehive equipment that you're going to see. It's not very often you see anybody that has more boxes than that. Um, not in the hobbyist, just backyard beekeeping. Um, starts with a hive stand, ramp, whatever you want. That, and that's something you see on some. Um, most don't have it. Most start with a bottom board on some kind of cinder box. And a bottom board consists of, like that picture there is a solid bottom board. There's also a screen bottom board. Um, most people who use screen bottom boards, they're using that to combat varroa mites. So then you have your hive bodies or brood chambers or deeps. Um, you'll probably most commonly hear them in the bee world called deeps. Um, all just depends on who you talk to, whether they're deeps or hive bodies. Um, and then the honey super, well, you have the queen excluder. goes between the brood chamber and the honey supers. And then you have the honey supers, inner cover and outer cover. Some people, rather than use the inner and outer cover, they use a migratory cover. If you're going to use a telescoping outer cover like what's in that picture, you need to have some kind of inner cover, whether it's a wood inner cover or a canvas type inner cover because the bees will attach that with propolis to that top box. Okay. So, what? propolis? Propolis, okay. Um, and propolis can, sometimes you can break things just trying to get it apart if you can't get in there and move it. Um, so in order to get that lid off of his propolis down, you gotta cram your hive tool or something in there and do some pretty hard prying, which will a lot of times split the box. You know, so it's, um, an inner cover, I mean a queen excluder, that's something that you can, it, it's not a requirement to use. Um, I don't use them, I don't agree with them. Um, the bees, they die because their wings can't bring them back to the hive. A honeybee lives on an average 40 days, that's their lifespan. By having a queen excluder, they're forcing their way back and forth through there, it's wearing out their wings. Um, the other thing is, is a queen's sole purpose is to lay eggs. That's her job. As a hobby beekeeper, your goal is to get that hive as big and as healthy as you can so it makes it through the winter. By putting in the queen excluder, you're suppressing that hive. You're keeping it small. Um, three deeps, that's what I use, or an equivalent to three deeps. A lot of people, um, a deep honey super is anywhere from, there's arguments whether it's 60 pounds or 100 pounds. Um, so in between that, the ones that I'm lifting, I, I'm saying are closer to that 100 pounds, you know, 80 pounds. That's, when you get up here, they're heavy to lift. A honey super, when you're up here, it's heavy to lift. Um, and they're 40 to 60 pounds, that's. So, if you, on your, brood chamber, if you give her another box, most queens aren't going to lay more than that anyways. You know, three deeps, that's as big as her brood chamber is going to get. So if you just figure three deeps, you don't need the queen excluder anymore. You just have your honey supers up there and, and they do their thing. Now, you, if you, by doing that, you have, you have plenty of room for that queen and you have plenty of room for the honey. That hive is getting big, which is what you want. So I, a lot of people use queen excluders, and to your style of beekeeping, um, that may be what you need to do. Some people don't, they can't take care of a big hive. They, they have to shrink them down. The commercial guys, th they can't have big hives. It costs them millions of dollars to get them transferred around the country. You know, so there's, they have to use queen excluders. Um, so each one of the pieces of equipment, they're, they have pros and cons to using. One of the things that isn't in here, on top of the bottom board, you can put a slatted bottom board, 
which it gives space for bees to hang out. It has slats, gaps in there, leaves about two inch space in the bottom of the hive. If your hive is strong, you're going to have bees in there that don't have a job. They need some place to hang out. Generally, they hang out in the bottom third of the frames of the hive. So the queen can't get down there and lay. They don't put honey down there. It's just kind of empty space that's being taken up. Um, pollen gets put in there a lot of times. But by putting a slatted board on the bottom, you're giving some place for the bees that don't have a job to just hang out. Um, and also, it gives another second layer of protection against yellow jackets. Yellow jackets are the biggest predator that you have to deal with around here in the valley that's a, a continuous um, fight. The yellow jackets, if the yellow jackets get in your hive, they can kill it in about two hours. That's a strong hive. I had a hard time with mine with ants. Uh, I, I have heard, I never have had to deal with ants, so I haven't experienced that, but I've heard others talk the same thing. Did you say a slatted bottom board? Slatted. It's called a slatted bottom board. Um, I don't know if I have a picture. My Mega Hive um, course, I have a picture of a slatted board in it. The, the bottom of your hive has a, it's open, three-eighths of an inch gap on the front of the hive. And there's, there's different people feel different ways whether you should leave your um, entrance reducer in um, all the time and, and keep it down. Depends on the strength of your hive. I didn't bring a reducer. Um, you have a three-quarter by three-eighths inch hole, or you have, it's roughly, I think, two, two and a half inch um, opening in there. Some of them have up to a four inch opening in there. It's kind of interesting yellow jackets, so is that, there's only one way to get in, so that's how they can defend the ends to the hive. There, there again, that uh, comes to an individual type of um, beekeeping, because you can put some people drill holes in their hives to get entrances up, up higher. Um, I have what I put a um, upper entrance in my hives. Um, it's called an emery shim that I put in there. Um, that just gives another entrance higher up in the hive. Um, I put it between the brood chamber and the honey supers. And I have found that my bees tend to use that as their entrance. They very seldom use the bottom entrance. They just haul out dead bees and debris out that bottom entrance. It's an emery shim. Emery shim. It's a it's a three quarter inch shim that runs, you know, that just sits there and it has an entrance in it. Okay. You make those yourself? Yes. Yep. You sell them at your store? I do. Yep. Go ahead and this is a picture of a Langstroth hive. Um, this is a picture. I very seldom wear equipment. This is a picture of some equipment that, I, I mean, my jacket and stuff that I do wear, that hive was Africanized. Um, that's why I'm wearing the equipment there. In this picture, you can't see the bees swarming all around. Um, but that was on Boot Jack Lake. The gentleman bought a nucleus package from somebody whose bees were in Arizona. Arizona is 100% Africanized. So if you're looking for bees and you're purchasing bees from somebody here in the valley, if they're from Arizona, do yourself a favor and don't buy them because you cannot work the bees. Even with the equipment on, they sting the daylights out of you. Um, there's, there's a couple different people in the valley that are commercial that bring their bees to Arizona and they sell nucleus packages to people around the valley. If you're going to buy from them, at least go out in their bee yard with them and find out if they're aggressive because um, you'll be calling me and having me come take care of your bees, and we'll have to try to requeen it. And to requeen an Africanized hive is a little bit of a job because the Africanized bees don't like our queens. They'll kill them and try to raise their own. So you have to requeen them about three times before it becomes successful. Um, and then at that point, you're far enough into the season that the likelihood that they make it through winter is getting pretty nil. How, how late in the season can you? that um, splitting your hive? Did you see them making the uh, queen cells? The queen cells? If they're making queen cells, it's not too late to split. Okay. You know, if they're making queen cells, there's generally time to, to um, 
take care of them. Unless they're making queen cells because you killed the queen or something happened to the queen. But if they're, if they're making swarm cells, um, that's, that's generally, you can make a split. Okay. The, you can make splits, really, as long as there's drones, you can make splits and the queen will hatch. It depends on the necker flow, whether or not they can have enough resources to put away for winter. Um, you can overwinter a nuke size hive. Um, there's just a little challenges to it that aren't there with a bigger hive. Right. <coughs> and a lot of times if we have a good um, napweed flow, if we have, like last year we didn't have a napweed flow at all, so it hurt our bees. Um, our bees get, a, they put away a ton of honey on napweed. So if you have a, a, a late running napweed flow, you can go pretty late and the bees will still be able to put away enough honey to make it through the winter. It said Langstroth hive. Them are Langstroth hives. There's also top bar hives and there's also worry hives. They're a, a worry hive is kind of a cross between a top bar hive and a Langstroth hive. And what a, a top bar hive is, you don't have the frames in there of honeycomb. It's all free formed. Most of the time you'll see them, they're kind of V-shaped um, and they're just bars that lay on the top. And a top bar hive runs this way and they build up in their hot top bar hives are harder to manage to get through the winter in this country <coughs> it's too cold they can't the, on a top bar hive in the winter time the bees move this way eating honey well half the honey's over here and half of it's over here when they get to this end they won't turn around and go find the honey over here they're at that end and that's it when they get to the end they starve out so that's if you're gonna have a top bar hive you need to get that that honey that's over here and moving in front of them. And that can be a challenge too because you can mess with them and all of a sudden they decide, nope, we're going the other direction because you messed with us. Um, so a Langstroth or a Warry hive operates similar to a top bar hive as you have top bars that don't have frames. They freeform their own wax and then it's space so they continue to go up like a Langstroth hive. That's how I normally do bees. Um, that's the extent of my equipment, unless they're aggressive. Um, I recommend that if you're going to keep bees, you at least start out with a jack or a hat and a veil. Um, many people can have bees crawling on their arms, hands, and they don't bother them. But when they get on their neck, face, or hair, it turns them into, you know, they start panicking. Um, so until you're used to it, have it there. The other thing that I recommend, I don't use smoke in my hives I use sugar water but if you're going to go in that hive you should have a smoker lit. If the bees go going to attack pheromone there's nothing that's going to stop it other than smoke. And I, I was on the wrong end of an attack pheromone and I got 50 some bee stings all at one whack and the gentleman whose hives I was going through all he had was a cigarette. <laughs> a cigarette don't quite do it. How do I get started? I've kind of covered most everything. Um, tools, smokers, hive tools, suit and jacket and gloves. Um, depends on how active you are in the hive. Bee gloves sometimes are too bulky to work a beehive. A lot of people find them to be, um, if you get the surgical, the latex surgical gloves that are um, prick resistant, them work fairly well. Uh, you can still get stung through them, but it's not as often. You still have the ability to feel what you're grabbing a hold of. Any questions as far as getting started, stuff we've gone through? How many brood boxes and supers do you need? Will they fill in just your first summer? There again, it's... it's um, your style of beekeeping, what you're doing. Um, when I was doing packages, I don't buy packages anymore, um, but I could have two honey supers, two deeps and two honey supers by the end of June. Okay. Um, but, you know, half a mile away when I was doing that, there was a gentleman that had been keeping bees for I think 20, 25 years. Um, he didn't have one deep filled. Mm -hmm. Half a mile is close enough that our forage was the same 
It was just how you help the bees, how you encourage them. Bee temperament might be a little bit in there, but it's, it's more of how you help the bees. It really, it comes down to your style of beekeeping. Is it, is it, if you have 10 frame box, I think I read when eight frames are full, you add your next box, is that all right? How do you do yours? Make sure they have lots of room. Yeah, that's you know, it's. Going up, put another one on. It's it's a such a hard um, to say when you're to feel. You know, I go I go about three quarters of my hive if if it's if it's drawn out and they're working it. At that point, I add boxes, but I generally don't add one box at a time. Um, my next my next topic is the mega hive and I walk through that's how I keep bees um, I add I add most of the time I add two bo at least two boxes on at a time um, that concept of wait till you know eight frames are full you're not giving your bees enough space you know and to tell you what each hive is a little bit different I, I, I guess you kind of learn when you go in that hive these things they need equipment. You know that the necker flows on. You know how fast they're working. You kind of get to know your hives. Um, I'm getting to the point, my beehives, that I have enough that I'm, I, I'm starting to just chunk, chunk, chunk. Where as a hobbyist, you're going through that hive and you know your hive. You get to know your hive. When, it's, when you have a small number of hives, you know how fast they generally are filling. So when you go in there, they have this much equipment and this hive is a real productive hive, you're going to want to add two or three boxes on when it's a honey super. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, a, on a productive hive, they can fill out a honey super in three days. You know, so if you come in and you put on one honey super and you think, oh, they'll be good for two weeks, well, you just, you just created a swarm. Okay. You know, so it's, it, yet you can have another hive right beside it that it'll take them all of that whole week to fill that that honey super. So it's, it's to tell you when to add equipment, it's kind of a, it's your style of beekeeping, the bees that you actually have, how much, you know, how heavy of a nectar flow is going on. It all plays a part in when do I add equipment? How do I add equipment? You know, it's. What's the difference between a package and a Go package? ahead. Package and a nuke. A package is like this. It's a most commonly, three-pound packages is what you're buying. So Murdoch's and Western Bee. Started, you would buy both of those? Nope. There, there are two different ways to purchase bees. This is a four-pound package. This is a little bit bigger box. But if you were buying it from most people, it would be a three-pound package. That cage in there that has the queen in it has a plug in there. This is sugar syrup. So this queen is not their queen. Now you have 15,000 bees in here. This queen is not theirs. You dump these into a, a hive. They release this queen, and hopefully they accept her, and she starts laying in that hive. That's the goal with this kind. With a, pa a nucleus hive of bees, it's five frames of bees. Two of the frames have honey and nectar on them, or honey and pollen on them. Three of the frames, they're bee. It, it has all different stages of brood. And it's their queen. She's already laying, she's doing her job. So a nucleus hive, it hits the ground running. It, it is a hive. You're just giving it more space. So it's, it's, if you can, this is the best way to purchase bees, a nucleus hive. But nucleus hives are, um, they're harder to get. Especially if you're, with, the, with these new cardboard nukes that they have, I shouldn't say new because they've been around for a while. Um, it's easier to transport nukes than it used to be. It was harder to transport them. They died before they could get them anywhere. So these package bees, that's, that's why you, they do packages. At first, they're easier to make, and they can transfer them fairly easy. They can keep them cool. So that's, that's the most common way you're going to get bees just because of the red, redability of it. A nucleus hive is the best way to buy it. And if you can buy local nucleus hives, ones that have overwintered in, in where you're at, that's even better yet. The problem is, is 
by the time local nukes are available, you're pushing yourself late enough into the year that the, like, the likelihood of them being able to build up big enough to get into the winter is, is starting to, you can, but it all depends on your forage, all depends on how you're helping them. You know, that's, our nukes aren't available until late June, where these are hitting the ground end of April, first part of May. You know, that's when they come here. How much does uh, one of those typically cost? This year they're 200 bucks. But the, the local ones, um, based off of the price increase, last year they were selling at 240 locals. Um, the price increase that was just on our bees this year, I, I'm, I'm going to guess they're going to run 260, 280. That's just a guess. Um, you know, have to see what everybody actually starts charging for them. But bee prices climbed drastically this year. What about protecting the hive from like bears and deer? And electric fence. Electric fence. Um, five strands of electric fence. You need to have one jewel electric fencer. A lot of people say, well, how many volts? I don't know how to convert the volts to joules, um, but bears need one joule to deter them. And a lot of the electric fences that I've looked at don't even have a joule rating on them. They just say five mile, 10 mile, or how many volts run through it. So you have to find something that says how many joules that electric fencer is. Um, the ones that I looked at that I researched to try to find out how many joules the most common electric fencer, I think, is a half a joule. So it's 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 not something that you're just going to go buy. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to buy the medium of the road fencer because some of the cheap ones are are one joule. You know, so don't don't base it off pri price. Don't base it off how many miles it is. Figure out whether it's one joule or not. And if if you're going to get a solar powered one, um, because your bees are where there's not electricity. Your fence is going to cost a minimum of four hundred dollars. The fish and game has a good program too. Yeah, defense against wildlife. Go and look on on their um, web web page, defense against wildlife. They and I, I believe they re they match you dollar for dollar up to they'll pay up to a five hundred dollars. So you have to spend a thousand dollars to get the five hundred dollars. I haven't used that. Um, program, but I, I, I know a lot of people who have. It's it's a good resource for getting. And around here, bears are um, very much something you want to think about. And if you have the possibility of bears, get the fence put up before you get your bees. Um, two years ago, I bought a gentleman out. Um, he had a grizzly sow. He had hog panels lit up with the biggest fencer he could get. And she backed up 100 feet, started squalling, and plowed right through it. He sat there and watched her. And he said at that point, he's like, there's no point in me fixing my bees, getting because she's just going to do it again. Once they learn that that's a food source, it doesn't matter. That, the larva is what they're after. It's high protein. Uh, you know, well, they'll eat the honey too, but it's the larva that they're after. It's, it's very high protein for them. You don't want to see that. That is poor management. Um, that's something bad happened, um, swarm, knocked hives over or something, bear got in the bee yard, something. Anybody has any questions? We have um, five minutes left of this one and then a 15 minute break. Back to the yellow jackets. What to do? What to do? The easiest way to trap for yellow jackets is take a pop bottle where the neck comes down and it flares out to its widest point, cut it off right there, turn it around, flip it upside down, tape it or staple it, pour some pop in there, and a piece of hot dog or baloney. That's the easiest, most effective trap you can get. The, the pop attracts the, bee, the yellow jackets, the meat attracts the yellow jackets, and the two ferment, that also attracts the yellow jackets. What's that? Not the meat is a deterrent for the honeybees. That's why you're putting the meat in there. If you left it just the pop, yes, the yellow jackets would come in. But the meat, by put, dropping the meat in there, the yellow jacket or the honeybees want no part of the meat. So it's it's <laughs> you, you want that meat in there, and yellow jackets are attracted to both. Um, when we had yellow jackets, we put uh, kind of 
kind of a stick over and put the meat on top, or a board and put the meat on top of that, and then as they ate, they fall into the soapy water. Yeah, that's that's that. There's a lot of different types of traps that you can you can do like that, putting over soapy water. Um, them ones there. You, if you go online and look up yellow jacket traps for a bee yard, they will give you a ton of, but from my own experience, that's been the most effective, the pot bottle. Another good thing to do is go ahead of time and get rid of your yellow jacket nests right. before they start to hatch out. Actually, right now is the time to put out your traps because yeah. you'll catch the queens. The queens are going to be coming out here in another week. I, I've actually seen a few already. What is the sugar water in the spray bottle do when you're opening? So I, I use sugar water instead of smoke. Mm -hmm. It gives them something to do. So they're like licking? Them. They're licking, cleaning. Um, so when I open the hive, I spritz them with sugar water. If you smoke them, the first thing that happens when you smoke them is it pisses them off. That hi It just lights that hive up. Just and then they start eating honey because their, their hive's on fire. Honey to a bee is when they do that is like alcohol to an alcoholic. It just calms them down. They're just they're they're saturated with honey. Life is you know there's there's nothing you know they're they're full of honey. They can't. You spritz it over them or you put a pan on. Nope, I spritz them. I have it in a water spritzer. I just um, when I crack the hive, I, I open the hive up, something like that. Yep, that's exactly what I use. Um, and I just squirt it. And once I squirt it. Let it sit for a couple seconds. I peel everything off, and then I start working them. And when you're when you're working them, you'll notice that all of a sudden you got a set of eyes looking at you, another set of eyes looking at you, another set of eyes looking at you. You know, and they're 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 you know that they're paying attention to you. When that gets to a certain point, you know, okay, it's it's time to give them another spritz, or they're going to start coming out and stinging. Them. <coughs> so you you just give them a spritz, and they go back to cleaning themselves and doing their thing. So they literally are one. That's why they call it a hive, I'm saying. Right, yep. Enough of them actually notice the same thing. Yep. The whole group. Yep. Once they, once they get to a certain point, um, and they talk to you, they'll let you know that get out of here before they start beating you in the head. And some people call it pinging, thumping. Um, when you're out there, they actually thump, thump. And for me, because I don't have gear on, when they start thumping me, I just, I just walk away. You know, and they'll, they'll follow me and thump, thump, thump. Pretty soon, okay, I'm far enough away from the hive. They go away, and I walk back and continue working the hive. Um, but when I come back, I grab the sugar spritzer and give them a spritz. Sometimes before I walk away, I'll spritz them, you know. But as long as you listen to them, they talk to you. They tell you what they're what they're wanting, and if they're pinging you on the forehead, they're telling you to go away. So it sounds like a natural thing is they just keep growing. The hive keeps getting bigger and bigger. What if you don't want a whole bunch of hives? Like, what if you want to keep it small? So, put a queen excluder in. But here's, going into winter, I tell a lot of people, if you can go into winter and make a bunch of nucleus-sized hives, when you come out of winter, okay, and if you have too many hives, you don't want that many hives. You only want one or two hives. That's what you're looking for. Or five hives. Five kind of seems to be the magic number that everybody wants. They don't want any more than that. That's, that's plenty. Um, you can always get rid of hives. You know, you can combine them, you can sell them, you know. You have a, a hive like that that made it through winter, this year, guess what the price is? 240 at least, because that's what it was last year. It can be up to 280. So just because you overwintered a hive and you have too many, you just made 100, 200 bucks. How, okay, so how do you overwinter? Um, that's, that's a bigger topic than I have time to cover here. Um, it's a little bit of research and you can figure out how to, um, but back to your question, at that point, okay, I only want two, I only want one, and I only want them, I can combine them, get rid of a queen, and I have it. But if you go through the winter and you come out with zero, it's kind of hard to start from zero. You know, you have to purchase another hive. So going into winter, you're, you know, you're late fall, bust them up, you know, make yourself some nukes, maybe... You have two full strong hives that them are the ones you want to go through winter, but if you have ten, the likelihood that you get through with two is far better than if you have two and go through the winter. 
So the idea of having two high bodies or deeps and that being enough for a season really isn't realistic. No. That might no. be what you start with. That's what you start with. Yep. Um, yeah, you, you, you two, two, you won't even make it into June with two high bodies. And you'll have your hives already swarming. If the next, if we, if we start out with a decent spring, you know, if we have a late spring, well, then yeah, you can make it. But two high bodies is not. I mean, even that kit that we showed there, you know, that's, if that's all the equipment you have, there's going to be years that that's not enough equipment. Just, just keeping bees, just letting them do their thing, really. What about just getting new bees every year? Of there's people who get new bees every year. That's, that is an option. Yep, that's the money. That's. Do you come out and help people set up hives? I do for a fee. What's your fee? $100 within 25 miles of Kalispell. After that, it's another $2 per mile. And you're down on. by? Uh, Woodland Park. Okay. Yep. So, so you've, you've got, say you've got five hives, and uh -huh. you're trying to open them. Do you put straw bales or do you do anything around them? I do not. And, and I don't because I'm trying to raise northern hardy bees. You know, I would put tar paper around them.